Our next guest spent 21 seasons in Major League Baseball, eight of them spent with the Detroit Tigers. He was active in Baseball Chapel, was a three-time All-Star, and was given the nickname Frank Tanana Daiquiri by Chris Berman of ESPN. We are very blessed to have Frank Tanana with us tonight. How you doing, Frank? Hey, I'm doing good, guys. How are you? We are doing fantastic, and thanks for <laughs> taking some time to, to chat with us. We're going to kind of trace your career here and, and really get involved with what you're doing now, which we really think is a neat thing. First of all, uh, you know, born and raised in Detroit, a Detroit boy. i uh, got to ask you right away, uh, how, uh, how many days did you uh, spend at Tiger Stadium? You had to spend a few days at the corner, didn't you? Well, I did. My, my, uh, I had a neighbor that uh, they didn't have any children, <clears throat> and he kind of uh, took me under his wing. My dad worked a lot and, and was, was unable to get me to games, but my neighbor would take me on occasion when I, of course, myself wasn't playing ball, which was quite often. Who was your favorite Tiger? Probably Mickey Lolich, being a left-handed pitcher. Okay. Uh, like I was. I, I uh, loved Lolich. And, of course, uh, you know, K-Line was everybody's favorite. Exactly, and you had the same experience growing up that we did in terms of that time frame, the 60s when the, the Tigers were uh, really coming into their own, and then, of course, the 68 uh, World Series, which we all have fantastic memories of. Now, in addition to baseball, uh, you were a, a multi-sport athlete, weren't you? My other passion, guys, was uh, basketball. I loved basketball and uh, was going to go. In fact, I signed a letter of intent to uh, Duke University back in uh, 1971 if baseball wasn't the way I went. Now, you uh, wind up being drafted uh, by, or you wind up with the California Angels, I'm assumed drafted by the Angels, I think, in the first round. And uh, talk to us uh, about that. That had to just be a heady experience. It was. It was a wonderful experience. The The difficult part was I had a bad arm at the time. I, I had pitched, you know, when you're pitching, your, your arm's always sore. And this one was a little more sore, and I got there and couldn't pitch. In fact, I missed my whole first season of pro ball with a, with a bad arm that never did get well. So got off to a rocky start, but uh, think things got better from that point on. At what point did you think, wow, I got a gift here. I got, I got an opportunity to play more than uh, summer ball or high school ball. I was always one of the better players on the team, right from Little League on. Uh, I had developed a little bit beyond my years. My father was a great athlete, and I played the catch. He would take me to, uh, he played softball on the police force after getting out of pro ball. So my skills were a little far beyond uh, other kids my age. So usually I was one of the better players and just kept uh, playing and, and really had the dream at a at very young age. I'd say probably about seven, believe it or not, I can recall telling people, and they'd laugh, and sure, 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 but, you know, <laughs> it was it was in there. It was in, in my being. Uh, the, jumping again back to the Angels, I, I believe you spent eight years there, uh, and then from a, a span from 1974 to 1978, you never uh, win less than 14 games. Your ERA is in the, in the twos. You have another guy that a few people have heard of by the name of Nolan Ryan, and you were a, a fireballer back in those days, uh, you know, tossing over uh, 200 strikeouts a, a game. That uh, had to be some fun times, wasn't it? It really was. Uh, Nolan and I were uh, probably as the, the most dynamic one-two punch uh, that of that decade from the left, left-hand left pitcher, right-hand pitcher. You know, being on the same team and as good as he was, it was a good challenge. We challenged each other and I think uh, really helped each other get the most out of our ability because both of us, of course, wanted to be the best pitcher on the team. And so that really helped, uh, helped spur us on and it was quite certainly, again, a, a very heady experience to be that good at such an early age and, you know, win that many games that, that soon and pretty much dominate, you know, the league. In addition to Nolan Ryan, you also had opportunity throughout those years to play with Frank Robinson and Rod Crew, among others. Any specific standout memories among that trilogy of incredible players? Well, you know, not specifically. Don Baylor, Joe Rudy, uh, Gritch, Carew, Robinson, these guys were all great players. And sadly, the real uh, memory that I have was the fact that we didn't really win. That's the. <laughs> we had some good day players, and it was nice to play with them, but. I was after the W's back then, and uh, we as California Angel teams, except for the late 70s, when we did win the division, we weren't, uh, we weren't very good. Going back to one of your first years with the Angels, 1976, you had a salary that would seem incredibly modest by today's standards, but you were actually the third highest paid player on the Angels at $76,000 a year. At that time, did you think you were rolling in clover? Oh, I was. I was, <laughs> yeah. It, that was uh, certainly... In, in for a young man, that's a lot of money. 
I was in my early young 20s, so that was fine. But then it even got finer because, of course, free agency hit after that year. And then, uh, you know, that 76 went uh, a whole lot higher, and they wanted to give me it, so I had to take it. You know, so <laughs> it worked out well. Your mindset, as you said, you know, uh, you didn't have a, the, the greatest teams when you were the, with the Angels, so you knew pretty much that you're going to have to shut down the other team to uh, either a shutout or one or two runs to have a chance. Does that wear on you as a pitcher? Keeps you sharp through really the first pitch to the last pitch because I knew that, uh, like you said, if I gave up two chances are I was going to lose the game. So I I would always be, you know, come on, guys, give me a couple today. And I said that early in my career, and I regret that because that's kind of the run support I got most of my career was about two runs, I think. So I really really regret saying that. At the end of my career, I used to say, get me 10, because I've never lost when I've gotten 10 (laughs) runs, guys. Get get me 10, and we'll win this game. (laughs) We seem to be experiencing some very similar times with the Tigers today. We look forward to games where you have Verlin, Andrew Jackson when he's really at the top of his game, a lot of nights with Rick Porcello. Does a pitcher ever get resentful of either his offense or maybe a bullpen that lets down games when it seems to be that they're out there doing their best every night and the games just tend to slip away? Again, I think certainly, you know, you're human and sometimes you're very single focused and you think the other guys aren't doing their job. You seem to forget the days when you didn't do yours. So you may have a little poor, poor, you know, me party. Everybody goes through that. But the way I feel about it, if a pitcher uh, leaves it in the hands of another pitcher to get the job done, then, you know, that that's he's got nobody to blame. Uh, and, and nowadays, if a guy goes six or seven innings, they're very excited and they get him out and go to the pen. Hmm. When I was younger, the, the attitude was, if you're any good, you go nine. And and whenever I handed the ball off to somebody else, if they didn't get the job done, I didn't have it. I didn't blame anybody but me uh, okay. for not pitching better. I would never blame another pitcher. Frank, I understand not only your fastball was fast, but your lifestyle was fast. Uh, tell us what it was like being a young guy in Los Angeles, kind of the town that never sleeps, Sin City. Uh, what was that like for you? Well, uh, again, it was it was very very uh, worldly. I was young. I was I was foolish. I was. Uh, chasing uh, the wrong perspective. My perspective was, you know, just to have a great time. I actually said the statement, I don't think, I don't know if I'll be alive when I'm 30. Mm. Uh, And I pretty much lived like that. You know, said the city never sleeps. I didn't sleep a whole lot myself. And, you know, that was just my lifestyle and the attitude that I have at that point. And that that attitude just about ruined uh, my career because I ended up hurting my arm and almost was out of the game. In fact, it did, uh, of course, hurt. uh, You know, I had to change my style, and I changed a lot of things. I changed my perspective and my style of pitching just to to survive, really, in life. I was going to ask you that, Frank. Was was your arm injury, was that the the key moment that that not only obviously changed the way you pitch, but also changed the way of, uh, of your life, really? Well, that was uh, one of the contributing factors. I had three in about, uh, actually four in that period of time, 1977, 1978. My arm was hurting. I got married. I um, had a teammate, Lyman Bostock, shot and killed, who was in the prime of his life at age about 27. Lyman was shot to death in Gary, Indiana, uh, during the season. And then I, uh, someone shared the gospel, opened up the Bible, and talked to me about Jesus. And those four, God really used those four circumstances to um, get me thinking differently. I remember the Lyman Bostock incident as well. I was uh, always a baseball fan, and certainly just the shock of that—that that was something that you did not hear. I mean, you know, baseball players in their in their prime did not die, let alone you know uh, you know a situation that that Lyman found himself in being shot. Uh, can you take us kind of back to that that period? And I mean, it had to just be a draw jopping shock, wasn't it? Well, it was. I mean, we woke up uh, Saturday morning in Chicago to that uh, horrible news that uh, a teammate of ours had been killed and, and, you know, shot uh, to death. And so it was a very numbing uh, three or four days as we, uh, you know, just made it through his funeral and, and all of that. It was uh, it was very, uh, very hard time, but like I said, a very... Uh, uh, awakening time for Frank Tanana. Who was the person that kind of set you on the um, 
uh, on the on the good road here? Was there was there one individual? Was it a combination of of several, or or how did that? Well, all... basic, yeah, it was one. We had a chaplain by the name of John Warehouse. John was our chaplain. He was an ex pro ball player who found Christ um, in uh, Hawaii of all places when he was playing minor league ball. And John became the chaplain of our uh, team, the California Angels, for for years while I was there. And, and John was very the instrument that God used to uh, get me get me started on my on my uh, trusting of Christ. Now you have obviously friends. I mean, you had this lifestyle before where you were a fast liver, really didn't care about a, a lot of things. Now you're on this new path. Did that mean new friends for you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it really did. It did. Uh, not that I rejected any of my friends, I rejected what I did, and consequently when you do that, you know, I wasn't a bar hopping uh, wild man anymore, um, so that, yeah, that's going to change, um, you know, after trusting Christ back in 1983, it, it took me a while to fully understand and, and get it right, as to have the proper biblical belief uh, to become a genuine believer in Christ. Um, yeah, things change, as you know. Uh, the Bible says, uh, you know, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things pass away, and new mm-hmm. things have come. So the new things, of course, were, were my faith and my love of God and my love of uh, people, my love of uh, obeying God and what he said to do. And I began to reorder my life, and naturally that uh, brings a great change. And, you know, you witness to the people that you know and tell them what Different Scott has made in your life, and the most of most of them just say, "Well, that's good for you. I'll I'll see you later. I'm pretty happy with the way I'm living." And and I say, "Well, that's fine, but I'm going this way now." And you know, right. see ya, Frank. You've been married to Kathy for over thirty years now. Did this change in lifestyle come prior to your marriage to Kathy, or just after? It came actually. Kathy and I were married. We went to a Bible study. We were married in January. We went to a Bible study in the fall. Kathy um, came to know and, and put her faith and trust in Christ at that Bible study that fall, and we were, uh, it was another five years after that that I trusted Christ. So we were, uh, we were married as unbelievers, and then she came to faith in Christ early in our marriage, and I came five years later. What we'll do is we'll kind of weave this around here a little bit uh, and and certainly come back to this, but as far as your baseball chronology, then you wind up with the Boston Red Sox. And i got to say, Frank, I mean, you're a left-hander. You're coming (laughs) back from arm injury, and you're going to the big green monster over there in Boston as as a left-hander, and you had to be thinking, holy cow, somebody hates me, huh? (laughs) Well, the timing wasn't good, that's for sure. (laughs) I mean, I would have loved to have walked into that park with a a greater arsenal of speed and my pitches as a young (laughs) Frank Tanana versus this guy who's trying now to kind of recreate himself and had a wonderful manager, Ralph Houck, and Ralph was wise. I had 24 starts that year, 16 on the road, only eight at home. Uh, you know, he knew the what was going on with my career and uh, great man, loved him as a manager. I just didn't have the kind of year and they, they let me go after one year. You go on to the uh, Texas Rangers and, of course, uh, really uh, re, uh, rejuvenate your career there a bit, don't you? I, yeah, I do. I, I come to Christ in 1983. I joined the Rangers in 1982. And with my love for Jesus now, uh, there's a real uh, change in even my career and the way I approach it, the way I take care of myself physically. Uh, I become a, a, just really in great shape. Um, I figure some things out as far as pitching. That comes together, and I win 15 ball games with the Rangers in 1984. And uh, so things are more on the upswing. And then, of course, one of the best things that ever happened was uh, we have a new manager. He comes in, and I'm not playing that well in 85. And when new managers come in, they like to get rid of the veterans because they know they have influence mm-hmm. in the club, especially the veterans that aren't producing for them that great. <laughs> so Bobby Valentine moved me on to Detroit, which turned out to be one of the best moves for my career. How tough was it to go from this flame-throwing fastball specialist to learning an entirely different way to pitch? Uh, well, it's very humbling, and uh, I went into humbling, but uh, <laughs> that was the only way to survive, and finally figured out um, what I needed to do. And then the bottom line was when I threw hard, I threw 80% fastballs. 
when I threw softer and didn't have that overpowering fastball, I could tell people fastball was coming when I was younger, <laughs> and they still couldn't hit it because I could put it in a good spot. When I was older, I couldn't do that. So I threw about 25% fastballs and the rest junk versus, you know, 80% fastballs when I was younger. Because I found that, and it's so true, no matter where you go, the object is to keep the hitter off balance. You must change speeds. If you can locate with changing of the speeds, you really neutralize and make it a lot tougher to hit. Because if you throw 100 miles an hour, we've seen guys, they throw hard. But if that's all they throw, Mm -hmm. these guys are great hitters. They're going to get you. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to be able to learn that and then get with a great team, which the Tigers were in the mid-'80s. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of neat things happening there. First of all, you're coming home. You're back to Detroit, where it all started for you. And obviously, you probably still have family in the in the Detroit area. And you're coming to a team that has just come off a, a world championship, and they still have a good nucleus from that club and uh, still are playing very competitive baseball. Oh, they're fantastic. I mean, you've got, uh, you know, Parrish catching and Evans at first, Whitaker second, Trammell, uh, Brookins, Herndon, Lemon, Gibson, uh, 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 Lopez, Rodriguez in the, in the bullpen. I mean, we were, uh, you know, Hernandez, we were outstanding. They were a good team, and I was more than happy to just be a small part of that team and, and ride the wave and add some more years to my career. When teams are winning, they seem to be very, very close. They're almost like brothers. It's amazing that winning can do that for you. Is that how you found this team? Yeah, this was a team. uh, Sparky Anderson, you know, was the manager. And Sparky really knew that, uh, and he he valued uh, closeness. He valued guys that uh, were going to get along and enjoy each other. Because he knew we spent more time with each other than we did our families once the spring training started. So we had no bad apples. If a bad apple showed up and, and wasn't fitting in, he'd get rid of them quickly. And so that really helped us. Uh, we were a close team. We had great leadership and, you know, Gibson and Trammell and, and Morris Petrie, you know, guys like that. Um, Brookins, it, it was outstanding leadership and guys really did. Uh, enjoy being together. We're talking with uh, Frank Tanana, and Frank, uh, 1987 was a phenomenal year. Actually, started out a bit slow, and I remember Sparky Anderson on a on a uh, pregame show. It seemed like he kind of lost his uh, lost his patience, not necessarily with you guys, but I think maybe with the media saying, "Hey, what's the matter with these Tigers?" And I think he he kind of dug his heels and said, "There's nothing wrong with these guys. These guys are going to win it." And almost said it from that point, and from that point on, uh, you guys turned it around. And I know Trammell had the offensively had the phenomenal phenomenal year you uh, you on that pitching staff that uh, that had a, a, a great year as well uh, talk to us about that uh, 80 uh, 87 season yeah that, that was a great year but like you said we started slow Gibson was hurt that was a big uh, he was a big clog a big part of our team and him being hurt early uh, we got off to a slow start I think we were like 11 and 17 11 and 19 something like that and then from that point on uh, it's probably when Sparky made the comments you said. We didn't lose a series um, the rest of the year. Well, yeah, we did. I take that back. We lost one. We lost three out of four to Toronto at mm. the end of the year in Toronto. But other than that, I don't think we lost another series, won 98 games, and just played really great baseball and edged out Toronto for the division championship. And I had the wonderful uh privilege of pitching the last game of the 87 season, probably the highlight game of my career if I had to pick one. Here in town, uh, playing Toronto, we, we needed to win the division, national television audience, uh, sold out, you know, people hanging from the rafters in Old Tiger Stadium, <laughs> over 50,000 people, and then to pitch a complete one to nothing win uh, over Toronto was just a... Uh, you know, it's kind of a dream come true. I was going to say, uh, what that has to be a bit surreal, too. I mean, you know, taking you back to that time, uh, just when you come back and, and you're pitching in Tiger Stadium, I mean, the, the same place where you could probably look up and say, hey, hmm. I was sitting there with my dad or my uncle or whatever, uh, just uh, what seems like a few years ago. Oh, yeah, I'd walk off the mound. I remember beating New York 2 to nothing my very first start with the Tigers in 85 and uh, walking towards the dugout. Of course, it was on the third base side and would just look up in the upper deck because my neighbor uh, would take me, and we'd sit like in the first or second row right above the Tiger dugout, 
And, you know, I just looked up there and just thought, this, this is too cool. Mm, man. And then, uh, of course, during your time in Detroit, you get to meet another guy that uh, right now we all uh, have come to love over the years, the Voice of Summer, who's going through a, a very tough time right now, uh, Ernie Harwell. And I know with you being involved uh, with the with the baseball chapel, um, talk to us a, a few thoughts uh, you have on, on Ernie and, and what he's meant to, to you. There's a lot of us. Uh, you know, I went to sleep. And that's Ernie's joke. You know, he's put more people to sleep in Michigan <laughs> you know, than anybody in the history of Michigan. I think he's right. Uh, I fell asleep as a boy with my transistor on, you know, and they'd be playing and listening to Ernie. And, you know, and then to come to the team and actually meet him and just see what a, uh, just a, a humble uh, lover of people a genuine guy, not a, you know, not a selfish bone in his body. Um, you know, Ernie would make you feel like you were the the, the only person mm-hmm. on earth when he was talking to you, which was so cool. Ernie was the greatest there you are person because there's two kinds of people in the world. There you are or here I am. Right. <laughs> Ernie was the greatest there you are person I think I've ever met. And uh so and he was very faithful. You know, when I came to the team, we began to have Bible studies, and Ernie was very faithful in coming to the studies and, and just being a part of them and part of the chapel, and just through the years became, and is, a very dear friend of mine and uh, had a chance to visit with him uh, about 10 days ago, and we just had a wonderful time, about an hour spent just, you know, being together and, and then praying together and... um you know, Ernie's ready. Ernie's ready to yeah. go be with Jesus. And uh, I think uh, the way he's handling this and the peace that he's exhibiting uh, hopefully is going to lead uh, others to consider uh, Jesus Christ uh, right. in their life. Exactly. Your career comes to an end. Was there a, was there a point uh, outside of somebody saying, hey, we don't want you anymore, Frank? That, or did you, were you able to kind of wind it down on your own, uh, own terms, uh, Frank, as far as your playing career? Well, actually, Kath and I had a little, um, my wife, Kathy, we had talked about it. She wanted me to be done after the 93 season. I, I thought, well, and, and I wanted to keep playing. Mm-hmm. And so we compromised, and I was going to play one more year. Our, our girls were at that teenage year stage. Three of them were, and, you know, girls need their daddy at home and uh, at that time. And I knew that, but uh, thought I'd play one more year. But Kathy ended up being right. Uh, I went to spring training with the Angels, and they released me halfway through spring training. And uh, 31 other teams didn't call. I said, babe, if the phone doesn't ring in a couple of days, uh, you got me. It's over, <laughs> and uh, we'll go on to that next stage of life. And, and she was right. Uh, that That's the way it worked out. I, uh, you know, Nobody wanted me. I know you go around and, and, and speak. You have uh, several Bible studies I know that, that you're involved with. Was, was that what you just jumped right into full force? Was, uh, was that right from your playing days? Yeah, after I got saved in 1983 and fell in love with Christ and began to follow him, uh, I was wonderfully discipled by a fellow by the name of Doug Sherman. And Doug was very instrumental in me uh, getting strong in the disciplines of our faith, and that is, of course, obedience to Christ and uh, learning how to study the Bible daily, read the Bible, spend time with God uh, daily versus just once a week on a Sunday morning, learning how to pray, learn how to share my faith, out talking to people about Christ, you know, with the belief that... um, you know, Christ is alive, and the kingdom of of God, you know, is is coming, mm-hmm. and with it residing in my heart, and knowing that really the souls of men and the Word of God are the only two things that are going to last forever, it was just great to um, have Jesus as my priority. So when the when the career came to an end. I really, the transition was smooth because I was already uh, into discipling men and sharing my faith. Uh, wherever God would take me, that's where I would go, and I've just could, persisted in that uh, endeavor. That's my vocation, mm-hmm. really, is just a, a follower of Christ and able to, God had given me enough money to mm-hmm. not need to, quote, you know, have another job to... Um, Supply, meet my needs. He'd already met my needs far and beyond my expectations or anything I'd ever need, barring a economic collapse of this country. 
So with that out of the picture, I, I just felt it was uh, you know imperative for me to just devote myself to seeing how many people I can you know win for Christ and how many believers I can help mature. And I know your wife is is very instrumental in this as well. In fact, I think uh, uh, some of the seminars that you have or the talks that you have, you'll break off with the guys, talk to them, and she'll uh, break off with the ladies and, and kind of give them the kind of the female perspective on things, right? Absolutely. Kath and I have got has created a, a marvelous marriage. Uh, we have a we've been married thirty one years, and it's to his glory. It, it's to his credit because without him, I know uh, we wouldn't be married. I would have blown it. He would have had nothing to do with me. But because of Christ, our marriage is strong, and we love doing marriage retreats. We've done some, and she heads up our uh, our women's. She's the women's director at our church, uh, leading that ministry, and it's just been a very exciting uh, life in Christ for Kath and I. Got to ask you something re- relating to to uh, today as far as baseball. Do you still find yourself, you know, a Tiger fan? Uh, you know, watching them on TV, listening to them. You still you still involved in 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 that at all that way? I was a Tiger fan when I was playing with other teams. <laughs> <laughs> when you're raised and it's in your yeah. blood, like it was mine at an early age. After the first thing I would go to, I'd be playing with the Angels, but I'd still find myself looking at the Tiger box score because I'd done it my whole life, and I still do it. So, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a big-time Tiger fan. I I have trouble because I've seen so many ball games, and, and life has just taken on other things. I, I just can't sit and watch a whole game, though. Right. I, mean, I can catch bits and pieces, and I'll hear, but I just cannot, barring a you know World Series game or something like that where you got a group of people over, but... I follow, but uh, I don't keep score like I used to as a kid. I don't want, I can't sit and watch the whole game, but I, I'm definitely a big fan. Got to ask you this, too. I know we're, we've infringed on your time here, so we'll wind it up here pretty quickly. But, you know, today there's so much emphasis on pitch counts, and, you know, you, you wonder about that. Are the kids getting to the point, you know, they're, they're, they're supposedly caring for the arms more. But, you know, I look back to one of your heroes, Mickey Lolich, mm-hmm. throwing over 300 innings. You yourself threw a lot of innings. Now you did have your arm problems, so maybe that's a, a, a cause of that. Are, are you a big fan of the, the pitch count? Do you think we're babying people too much? I mean, I know there's a huge investment in pitchers nowadays, and, and players in general, so that's the thinkology. You, you, they want to keep players around as long as they, they have, but has something been lost in, in all of that? Well, <clears throat> here's, here's my thoughts on that, guys. I think we have, in baseball, followed pretty much society. I think we're a soft society. Mm-hmm. We've had uh, everybody's entitled, everybody's been given things. Uh, most people haven't had to sacrifice or, or really even work hard. Uh, I think our mentality is different than it was certainly in the 50s, 60s when I was playing. And so I think with that, with us being a very soft culture, I think, uh, again, we, we, uh, baseball's kind of followed along that way. Mm-hmm. I think uh, guys are being babied. Um, they have a lot of mo- money invested. They're trying to, you know, keep their investments from getting hurt. But I think there is something lost in, uh, you know, 100 pitches, okay, get them out kind of thing. Uh, but that's the perspective that they have these days. And so, you know, what are you going to say to it other than it's different uh, from when I was uh, being raised? But I think as a whole, I think, um, you know, sacrificing and, and, and hard work and struggling, I'm not sure our uh, our society, you know, Mm-hmm. We've been given a lot uh, mm-hmm. from that previous generation, and they, they had to work hard. They went through world wars and things like that, and we have went certainly through some things, but, you know, the Great Depression and that, we've had it pretty good, I think, in the last uh, 30 years or so. Well, John and I have been longtime fans of your career. We appreciate what you did for the Tigers in those special years that you were at the corner, and real treat for us to talk with you today. We wish you continued joy and just a great lifetime of happiness. Thanks, guys. I appreciate being on with you, and uh, just make sure you just keep your eyes on Christ. He is the author and finisher of our faith, and let's just keep our eyes on Him and, and love Him, serve Him, worship and adore Him. Huh? What do you say? All right. Sounds great to me. That's the way right. to go. Thanks, Frank. All way right. to go. Thanks, Frank. All way right. to go. Thanks, Frank. All Way right. to go. Thanks, Frank.